People have been getting sick and getting well since as long as there have been people. And ever since they've been getting sick and getting well, they've been trying to help the getting well process along. They used to do that basically by doing whatever felt to them like it would work, which was pretty much the same technique they used to try to cause the weather to be the way they wanted it to go. While they didn't have a lot of success in getting well by controlling the weather or by doing magic back then, they also didn't have much organization to do really anything until fairly recently. From a Martian perspective, Earth with humanity looked like pretty much another species until only a few thousand years ago. But by around 2500 BC, you could see a pretty significant amount of systematic organized activity. People were dragging giant chunks of rock across the desert and putting them into stacks. And this required large, centralized, integrated hierarchies. It is estimated that about 2 to 3% of the GDP of Egypt, that is, of the energy that humans were consuming, was dedicated to this task. And somewhat unsurprisingly, the task was aimed at making people get well, or trying to do so, after they had died and you know, been mummified. Now, from a Martian perspective, looking at the world today, we're spending about 16 to 19 percent of the GDP in America, and 8 to 12 percent throughout other OECD countries in trying to make people get well, or perhaps we are. But we don't seem to have unambiguous evidence, like giant pyramids forming in the desert. We have some hospitals here and there. It's perhaps not so striking, given the amount of money we're spending, compared to other less organized activities that we're engaged in. And this may be because we're more subtle and we have more idea of what we're doing, or it might also be because we are organized less tightly than the Egyptians were when building their pyramids. So, how do we know about our healthcare system? Well, how do we know about a weather system? If we are trying to control the weather, first we should understand it. We might notice that snowflakes are all going in the same direction, and we would suggest that there's this thing making them all go in the same direction, and we'd call that thing wind. Or we can stick our finger up in the air and try to feel the wind directly. Um, we ought to be able to do something, set up sensors in one place and another, and then another, and notice that first this one becomes, says that it's getting colder, and then this one, and then this one, and then we would say that a cold front is coming through. Now, the temperature of the air, just the random movement of molecules, we would not call weather. That's just heat. Um, before the 1860s, no one anywhere thought that they had a healthcare system. If you asked people about healthcare, they wouldn't know what you meant. But if you asked them about doctors, those were the guys with the leeches. And the, they stuck the leeches on you, and sometimes you got worse, and sometimes you got better, but you could hope you'd get better. Starting in the 1860s, Florence Nightingale uh, organized the British Army in the Crimea and later in India and she did statistical analyses, discovered which techniques that the doctors were doing made people get better most of the time, and which techniques didn't, which techniques for organizing the beds and nursing care made people get better, and which didn't. And the total fatalities of the British military in India fell by about 70% over a decade. It was a spectacular success, which was soon imitated all over the world, not only in military life, but in civilian life. However, while these systems were built from the 1860s to the, say, 1960s, nothing lasts forever, and by the 2009, Atul Gawande, a prominent surgeon at Boston Hospital, w was writing the book The Checklist Manifesto, describing how, at, at, for decades, people had known that merely by implementing checklists, and enabling doctors and other medical staff to make sure they had done all of the necessary tasks for a procedure, 
tens or hundreds of thousands of lives could be saved a year just from a few specific types of mistake. And no one really knew how many lives could be saved if you included all of the different types of mistakes. It seems possible that a system that isn't able to implement checklists or otherwise systematize what behaviors are taking place would also not be able to build pyramids or to implement consistent checks on what was making people get better and what was not of the type that Florence Nightingale found. This doesn't mean that they wouldn't be able to do research, find out what made people better in a controlled setting, but the real world might not match the research environment exactly. And even if they checked and found out that in a particular case, in a research hospital, people given this treatment were, had better results, people on average given that treatment for whatever reasons led to them getting that treatment once it became popular or fashionable might not get better results. So how do we know about a healthcare system? We should look for some systematic change in health outcomes that we would have if we have a healthcare system. In the same way you have a systematic movement in the snowflakes if you have a wind. When people have done this, in the 1970s, the United States government organized a 95% reduction in the cost of health care for 6,000 people for many years. And this is called the RAND study. And another controlled group, randomly chosen, did not receive such a reduction. When the study was done, they discovered that the experimental group, who had cheaper health care, as you might expect, spent more time in hospitals and in waiting rooms. They got more procedures, and they didn't live any longer. In fact, the only indicator of health that was better for them was that they were more likely to have properly uh, prescription glasses. This would be astonishing, except that I had been in the Peace Corps, and I'd looked at global public health data, and I'd noticed pretty much the same thing between countries. Wealthier countries, there's a strong correlation between the GDP of a country and its life expectancy. But when you look at the effect of medical spending on life expectancy, there doesn't really seem to be any relationship. Instead, you see graphs like this, where the, the Kingdom of Jordan has an 80.2 year life expectancy with $450 per capita of spending. The United States, a 70 8.7 year life expectancy with $8,360 per capita of spending. And Libya, $490 of healthcare spending, similar to Jordan, and a life expectancy slightly lower than the United States, but closer to the United States than the United States is to Jordan. Meanwhile, here in Estonia, our life expectancy is 75.4 years roughly as far below Libya is, as Libya is below Jordan, and medical spending is about $1,200, roughly one-fifth what the U.S. spends, but roughly two and a half times what Jordan and Libya spend. People say the healthcare system is broken a lot, and if a system is broken, you can see ways in which it could be made better. Like a person who is, has a broken leg, you can see them limping along, but you can see the person. You, you're not unable to find an effect, you see food disappearing when they eat it, you, you, know, you see urine appearing in their toilet, you do not unfortunately see effects from the healthcare system. So from a scientific perspective, I'm inclined to conclude that no, the healthcare system isn't broken. It just doesn't exist. This shouldn't surprise us, it usually didn't exist. There were usually people trying to do what seemed to them like it would heal people, but they were not usually organized in a system that was scientifically shown to heal people. There's a lot of random doctors and nurses going back and forth, trying their best, and a lot of them have fairly good training, but random molecules going back and forth in the air is a different phenomena from wind. Metaphorically, we could say there's a lot of hot air, but not a lot of wind in what is called healthcare. Now, don't get me wrong, medical science that's real. It works great. A whole 10% of medical science, maybe even 20 or 30%, is supported by evidence that would check up 
if you looked at the papers carefully. And when you look at the best studies, evidence indicates that half of them have valid results, while three quarters of the consensus of the medical community can do, which is eh, better than the shamans. But while medical science discovers all sorts of amazing things, most of the amazing things that are new, that you see reported in the newspapers, they may not be true, but some of them surely are true. And yet, as time goes on, you find your experience in the hospital is pretty much the same as it was a decade ago, two decades ago, three decades ago. Most of the information doesn't seem to get out of the scientific world, which shouldn't surprise us much, because basically the only way in which it would would be if people got adoption of new policies in big bureaucracies which won't even adopt checklists. You would expect at least that some information could get out from the scientific world. If it was sensational enough, it was a big enough idea, amazing and shocking to people. So I thought about it. Well, what would be the most shocking thing the medical community could do? Well, the thing they were trying to do back in ancient Egypt, raising the dead. You would think that it, at least if people were raising the dead, that would get the public's attention. And people would hear about it and know that that was a service available in their hospitals. But scientists tend to have moral objections to branding. They try to be, you know, quiet and not draw attention to themselves, lest their co co-workers and peers turn against them. And so it turns out that if you are routinely raising the dead, who have been dead for 10 to 20 minutes, really quite a long time, at, say, the University of Pennsylvania, they call this the Center for Resuscitation Science. And people who really look into it might find out that it exists. And their practices have spread to some other research hospitals. But I expect it will be a long while before the oxidative reperfusion techniques and temperature manipulation that they use is spread widely throughout the world's hospitals. And given the track record of the, what's left of the medical system, we might expect that by the time it is, it will be implemented in ways that do not actually lead to better health outcomes. It's not just things that doctors haven't heard about, though, that don't get implemented. There's a study that's taught in every neuroscience class, and every doctor learns it when going through their schooling, because it's just so exciting. You see, there's this weird phenomenon called phantom limb pain. If you lose an arm, very often you will feel as if the arm was still there. And in many cases, you'll feel as if the arm was still there and in pain, which is terrible. Not only did you lose an arm, but you're in terrible pain all the time. And about 20 years ago, in massively publicized studies, which everyone is told about in their medical schooling, and everyone really who reads you know, newspapers about science eventually hears about this study over and over again. Anyway, it was discovered that if you put the intact arm in a box with a mirror across from the arm, and you set up an optical illusion so that it looks like the intact arm is duplicated where the missing arm should be, your brain interprets the reflection of the intact arm as the missing arm still being there. And you can feel the missing arm moving in the ways that the intact arm moves. And a lot of people in phantom limb pain, they can essentially stretch out their imaginary arm relax it, get it out of an uncomfortable position, and they can eliminate phantom limb pain totally in just a few minutes, maybe once, maybe two to three times. It's incredibly exciting and cool. So, of course, when people come into hospitals and have phantom limb pain, they get painkillers, which sedate them and detract from their quality of life and are addictive. And because painkillers, you know, are a pill, so that's the sort of thing that hospitals and doctors think of as seeming like medicine. And I read a paper by someone called, uh, on a blog, which is written down there, by someone who talked about how a patient had been to three doctors and been through 10 or 20 painkillers over the course of 10 years. And every time he met this patient and talked about her pain medicines, which never really worked, he would think about this experiment, but it took him three years of seeing her himself before it occurred to him to actually try it upon, which it, upon which it worked instantly, and she was grateful, while he felt guilty about not trying it, you know, before she'd been 
in another three years of pain. It's not just exotic problems that only affect amputees, though, that don't get implemented. It's problems that we all face. People were doing psychotherapy for many years, but studies didn't really show it worked. And so, once again, they mostly used pills. And when people developed forms of psychotherapy that did work, it got a fair amount of attention. But still, the large majority of patients don't get cognitive emotive behavioral therapy, even though at this point we have Nobel laureates appearing on TV and talking about how the types of changes to the brain created by this therapy closely match the types of changes to the brain created by the standard antidepressant pills, and the results shown by various measures are almost exactly the same, and of course, once again, with no side effects, etc. And it's not just depressed people. Everyone can apparently improve their self-reported happiness simply with 20 minutes a day, every other day for two weeks, of writing letters of gratitude to someone else in their life. This has been shown, tested scientifically, and is actually the largest effect relative to the amount of work of anything people have discovered in terms of making people happier. If you think happiness, unlike Wittgenstein, if you think happiness is what we're here for, this is the best news ever. And you, once again, probably never heard about it, and I expect we'll go home and not try it. But I hope some of you will. Another one is air filters. We know that smoke's bad for us. We know it's in the air. We know the city air is not as good as the country air in lots of ways. We can test this. We've done studies. We can show just how much it affects our life expectancy, you know, to have certain amounts of uh, smoke, of particles, get into our lungs. And we've, had, we've known this forever. And we've had filters. We've known how to remove these particles from the air forever. And we've had stores where you can buy these filters. And you probably do not actually use an air filter in your home and blow the air through, even though you can see all of the stuff that's not getting into your lungs that's being absorbed by the filter when you change it every year or two. Another way of keeping debris out of your lungs is just to switch to electronic cigarettes if you smoke. I haven't done any research on this, but really it stands to reason. I don't need to. On the other hand, sometimes I do need to do research. When I'm really worried about something, I'd like to check. Here was something that made me worry. A cereal with 100% of your RDA of iron. You know, iron, beyond the amount you need, is poisonous. It causes heart disease and hemochromatosis. Half of Estonia dies of heart disease. So I thought, you know, I'd better check to make sure no other minerals are in wildly wrong quantities. And I found out that bizarrely, when I did the research, it turned out that salt, which we all know in, is bad for us, appears to be insufficient in the typical European diet. The, while salt does raise blood pressure, which raises heart disease, all-cause mortality is lower in the highest third of salt-consuming Europeans than in the lowest third of salt-consuming Europeans, which kind of fits in with the observation that salt tastes good for us. And we've been living with it for billions of years, so we might expect evolution to have gotten this one right. But it, you don't need to trust evolution, even though it did get it right. Science got it right, too. It's just rumor and popular opinion and doing what someone else said to do that didn't get things right, just like it doesn't usually get things right. When we know that salt's good for us, we call it electrolytes. So, you know, it's in the, it's in the culture. But I, I just basically conclude that if we can be wrong about salt being good for us, what can't we be wrong about? I really think that we have to check. The healthcare system isn't broken. It doesn't, if you can't use the healthcare system to falsify some null hypothesis, it doesn't exist. But science does. And that's really the best way to find things out. We've got papers, we can do experiments, we can look for ourselves, we can hire other people to look for ourselves if we don't want to spend the time. It can work. So you just, you know, if you don't want to spend the money, trust your intuitions. If you do, trust the papers. <laughs>